afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for uh, Deep Bark Secrets of Tree Selection. The purpose of this presentation is to aid gardeners in selecting trees that will flourish in their landscape or in their community. And I am a lover of a good pun, but truly the only deep bark secret to tree selection is becoming well informed. And so we hope to do that today. Before we begin the discussion on proper tree selection, we'll address the importance of having trees in the landscape. There's certainly large elements uh, in any environment, both in size, in monetary investment, in time investment, and in the many benefits that they offer. A well-chosen site and a well-chosen tree species can bring long-term gratification uh, to the gardener, as well as advantages like uh, increased property values, um, improved environmental quality, and pot potential economic benefits through energy saving savings and other means. So um, trees have physical, psychological, and emotional benefits. Research has shown us that green environments created by trees can lower blood pressure, can reduce muscular tension, and improve healing and recovery times, um, both physical and emotional illness. Um, Research from the University of Illinois uh, Landscape and Human Health Laboratory shows that green spaces can actually reduce domestic violence and improve concentration for students in school. By the same token, public areas that are attractive and well-maintained um, will draw people to recreate um, and experience nature in their own ways. So parks and natural areas are often chosen to hold community gatherings or team sports, individual exercise, and even family picnics. Sometimes trees are historically important, providing the community, um, you know, pride and adding to its heritage. Many school and college campuses purposefully include green spaces, uh, including trees, into their landscape design to provide a place for students, staff, and visitors to enjoy. Also, trees properly placed um, in locations around a yard or property can help reduce energy costs um, for homeowners and businesses even. They, you know, placed in certain places can block the wind uh, for a structure that's being heated or provide shade to one that's being cooled. And not only do trees add to an attractive landscape um, and increase property value, but they also add value to neighborhoods and communities as economic, economic stimulus by attracting new community members to the area. Finally, last but not least here, trees have vast environmental benefits as they can moderate climates and create microclimates. The noise and glare from cities can be reduced by trees as well as wind and runoff. Trees remove carbon dioxide and carbon, and carbon monoxide from the atmosphere to increase atmospheric oxygen. Trees provide shade, uh, reduce air temperatures uh, through evaporative cooling, and provide habitat for wildlife. All important aspects, um, especially in our urban environments, where sometimes there's a lack of those things. So why is careful tree selection important? Um, well, we want it, we want that species to do well. We want to have it around for a long time, right? Um, because of these multiple advantages, um, 
to tr- having trees in your yard or in the landscape or community, it is important to carefully select uh, the tree species. We as gardeners invest a great deal of time, uh, money, and effort in planting trees. So ensuring this proper location or site is very key. Um, and so we want everyone to be well informed uh, when selecting trees for their area, maybe even develop a plan for selecting the site and, and the species that will be planted. Again, ideally, gardeners want these trees to last in the landscape and they want to retain these benefits from the trees. But in reality, trees are often put in conditions that lead to their decline or sometimes total failure. And as probably many of us know, tree removal can be incredibly expensive depending on the size and location and what kind of equipment they might have to bring in. And to replace a tree is yet another investment of time and money. So we are going to discuss ways to select sites and species that will allow trees to not just survive, but to thrive where where they are planted. So when asking what tree should I plant, it really comes down to this phrase, the right plant for the right site. Um, or in this case, the right tree for the right site. How do we know if it's the right plant for the right site? Well, is it going to do well there? Will it fit in the site? Um, Before considering exact specifics uh, of what constitutes the right plant or right site, you might decide what the function of that tree is going to be. Is it for screening? Is it for shade? Is it just for aesthetics, Um, which is perfectly acceptable? Um, Is it just because there was a blank space on the landscape design? It's good to know what the function of that tree, what the purpose of that tree will be before deciding what will be planted in a location. So for instance, this image depicts um, an eastern white pine Um, presumably planted for screening between neighbors. However, the mature size of this tree is far too big uh, for the space. And now it has to be limbed up to a degree that's ultimately unhealthy for the tree. And certainly it's not serving its purpose. Um, Some things to consider uh, before choosing the site. Um, Is planting legally prohibited or restricted in that site Um, by either city ordinance or law or any of those things? This may also become important on property lines that maybe have not been surveyed in a while to kind of mitigate any disputes between neighbors. Um, All too often, existing structures or utilities are ignored when planting a large tree, and we wind up with the tree being pruned around utility lines. Um, This can result in an unsightly tree or one with an unbalanced canopy, making it structurally unsound. Or even worse, a tree, um, you know, that that requires removal and someone attempts a dangerous DIY like um, the person in this image um, who attempted a DIY removal more than once, if you can see the second tree in the background, with a tree stand ladder that's up in that nearer tree um, over personal property and high traffic areas um, with children's play um, equipment um, and very near utility lines. It's important to keep yourself safe and to keep others around you safe. Um, If you can't prune with both feet on the ground, hire a professional. Saving money is not worth the injury. So making sure your planting spot is at least three feet from pavement um, or fencing on all sides, at least 15 feet from buildings or other trees. And if your tree is one that grows to be 25 or 30 feet tall or more, you want to keep it at least 25 feet away from overhead electric wires. 
Sight lines are also important to visualize before planting uh, a shrub on the corner of a property. These corner plantings can uh, grow to impair the line of vision and potentially endanger pedestrians or drivers. Um, and we don't want to install a larger tree than the area can support. So when these principles are ignored, we might wind up with a tree that requires yearly pruning, um, maybe to keep the tree away from the house or too large for the space, like on street boulevards uh, or parking lot medians. Yeah, the setbacks, certainly I will repeat those. Um, so you want to make sure your planting spot is at least three feet from any pavement or fencing on all sides, at least 15 feet from buildings or other trees. And if the tree is to be over 25 feet tall, keep it 25 feet away from overhead utility lines, especially electric. So now that you've taken into consideration um, and all the above ground conflicts are resolved, the next step in the right plant for the right place is considering site characteristics. Site conditions really should dictate the species selection. So we're going to um, discuss individually the climate and hardiness zones, soil type, uh, texture, and pH, drainage, and existing vegetation. Sun exposure is simply knowing how many hours of sun uh, that a location receives. So full sun is at least six hours of direct sun. Um, but all day sun often produces the best form and growth uh, for many large trees. Trees suited for full to partial sun will be adapted to a site that receives three to six hours of sun, direct sun. And then shade loving trees are adapted to sites with filtered sun or filtered shade, uh, those receiving less than three hours of direct sun. So again, most large trees grow best in full sun and some small trees grow best in sites receiving shade for part of the day. When it comes to existing vegetation, we wanna take care not to uh, plant our trees over an existing flower bed. If there's one that um, you want to remain in that location, because if you have full sun perennials, they're going to, that tree's going to grow to shade those out. Um, or perhaps that's your expectation and you'll be revamping or revising that perennial bed. We also don't want to plant too close to another tree, as I mentioned, um, because those trees are not going to have enough space to grow. In addition, the tree roots are going to be in competition for the same root space, for the same moisture and nutrients in the soil. So just a bit on climate here. Um, I'm located in Decatur, um, and so we're pretty much right in the middle of the state. But these um, charts indicate uh, the left is monthly temperature for Illinois, average temperatures in 2018. And the chart on the right is monthly precipitation for Illinois in 2018. Um, you know, uh, in Illinois, our summers are long and warm and humid. The winters are freezing and snowy and windy. Um, throughout the year, it's partly cloudy. Um, over the course of the year, temperature is going to vary from you know, 20 to 85, and rarely, but sometimes gets below zero or above 100. And so our hot season lasts for about four months. Um, a cold season lasts just over three months. Our precip uh, precipitation occurs in the summer and winter, of course, as rain and snow. And our length of day ranges from 15 hours a day in the summer to only nine hours a day in winter. Wind will also play a factor in climate and might be a consideration um, in species selection. And then we might also consider microclimate or your very localized conditions, which can vary due to topography like hills and valleys um, or level of development, how much structure is there, how much pavement or asphalt is there. Um, and for instance, along those lines, temperatures are usually warmer in cities 
due to the urban heat island effect. Um, all the kind of concrete and asphalt and buildings absorb that heat from the sun. And generally, that's uh, cities are warmer due to that. And trees can actually help reduce that urban heat, heat island effect. So uh, all of these kind of climate factors are important because not every tree species will do well in every climate or microclimate. Um, when we talk about zone hardiness, these are the uh, U.S. on the left. These are the USDA delineated hardiness zones ranging all the way from 13B in Puerto Rico uh, to up to 1A in Alaska. That's about the range that we have. Many of our tropical house plants, for instance, are hardy to zones 9 to 10. So obviously they don't survive our winters here in Illinois. Um, but specifically in Illinois, we're a very long state and we have five hardiness zones from 5A up in the northern region and down to 7A uh, down south. These zones are generally listed on plant tags, um, so it's good to pay attention so you don't, for instance, plant a philodendron type house plant outside expecting it to survive the winter because it won't, right? Um, however, with temperatures rising uh, due to climate change, some zones have gradually crept north uh, and some things that would not grow in Illinois in the past are now able to. Mm -hmm. um, so some species you can you can get away with, I guess you could say. Uh, for instance, crepe myrtle um, is hardy only to zone six, but occasionally it will survive in zone five winters. Maybe not necessarily thrive, but it can survive. Whereas the semi-evergreen Southern Magnolia is listed as only hardy to zone six. Um, but the foliage, because it remains over winter, can easily be injured by those winter temps. So while that species of Magnolia can survive Southern Illinois winters, the evergreen foliage would certainly be damaged in zones colder than six. So on to soils, of course, we know soils provide the water and nutrients and oxygen for a tree's root growth. Uh, soil has four main components. We have mineral particles like sand or silt or clay. We have organic matter and there's water and air in our soil. Healthy soils grow healthy plants, so it's a major factor in site selection. There are many different types of soil in Illinois. Um, you may have different types of soil even in a small yard. And that soil type is determined by the parent material, like rocks, uh, from which the soil was formed. Um, also determined by climate and slope and some other factors. Most soils in Illinois contain a combination of sand, silt, and clay particles. Um, and that soil texture is determined by the relative amounts of these three types of particles, sand, silt, and clay. And it really doesn't change over time. Also, soil pH plays a crucial, ro crucial role in the growth of vegetation because nutrient availability, um, the nutrients in that soil, and how available they are to the plants to up, uptake the nutrients, that's directly influenced by pH. So a pH scale runs from 0 to 14. And mineral soil pH values generally range from 3 to 10. However, nutrients are only readily available in certain pH ranges, um, with most plants thriving at pH values between 6 and 7. A majority of nutrients are available within that range. Um, occasionally, there are some tree species that prefer more acidic or more alkaline soils for that optimal growth and optimal nutrient uptake. So in this image, uh, we see this tree has been and its roots have been um, injured from poor drainage. Ideally, we're going to select trees that will tolerate the soil and the moisture conditions specific to that site. 
Um, when it comes to excess soil moisture, um, if we have a, too much moisture in the soil, it can reduce oxygen levels in the soil. It can damage fine root hairs um, and essentially render the root system unable to absorb water. So trees exposed to excess moisture often show similar symptoms as those under drought stress. Um, and some species of trees are very prone to root decay and become susceptible to fungal root diseases when they're grown on wet sites. Gardeners can conduct a soil drainage test by making a hole that's 18 inches deep and filling it with water. The water level should essentially drop three inches every half hour and be completely drained within 24 hours. There are some species of trees that will tolerate or sometimes even prefer poorly drained soils. Um, but for tree species that are not adapted to poorly drained soils, excess water will certainly cause problems. Uh, just a side note, um, having mentioned existing vegetation in an area, um, before we choose that species, um, we might also consider what plants are already growing nearby, whether it's in your yard, your neighborhood, the community at large. For local ecosystems, it's beneficial to use several different species, so we're providing food and shelter for a variety of wildlife. It's also beneficial to homeowners and communities to use diversity in tree plantings. Uh, really to lessen the chances of losing all the trees of that species in your yard or in the city due to a pest or pathogen that targets that particular species. For instance, um, chestnut blight completely wiped out um, or wiped out most American chestnut trees. Before that, we had Dutch elm disease that wreaked havoc on elms. More recently, uh, emerald ash borer devastated ash populations across several state, states um, and many communities we've used ash trees for good reasons um, we line our streets with them because they are tolerant of many urban conditions like drought stress temperature fluctuations uh, salt that we use on roads or sidewalks um, but when the emerald ash borer invaded some cities lost upwards of 20% of their street trees. 20% of their street trees had been ash trees, which made for, of course, costly removals, uh, costly replacements, and, you know, the loss of habitat, the loss of shade, and all the other benefits of green spaces that I previously mentioned. So in saying that, a common standard has been the 10, 20, 30 kind of rule of diversity, where we plant no more than 10% of any one species, no more than 20% of one plant genus, and no more than 30% of one plant family. So to illustrate, you know, kind of application of this method, let's look at a few commonly planted tree species. So for instance, the white oak, its species name um, is Quercus alba. It's part of the plant family Fagaceae. The first part of the binomial Quercus alba uh, is the genus, and the second word uh, alba is the specific epithet. Together, those two words compose the species name. So white oak is Quercus alba. So to implement the 10-20-30 rule, or 30-20-10, however you look at it, we would kind of look around our yard or our neighborhood, or maybe when we're driving through uh, the community, see how many white oaks are already present um, and, you know, encourage no more than 10% of local trees be white, white oaks, no more than 20% of oaks in general, and then no more than 30% of anything in the oak family, in that Fagaceae family. So the same with maples. Um, and if your neighborhoods are like my neighborhood, there are is an abundance of maple trees lining the streets. Um, so if we did the same thing with maples, we'd have no more than 20% of local trees are already maple. Or, sorry, if more than 20% of local trees are already maple trees, no matter if they're silver, red, sugar maples, 
um, attempt to plant another genus altogether. So get out of maples and kind of diversify. If you need assistance finding alternatives to these very, very commonly planted tree species, reach out to your local extension office um, for a list of alternatives. In fact, I think we've provided you one resource for that. Um, just another note, we want to make sure that the species we have in mind um, is a sound ecological practice would be to ensure the tree um, isn't on the list of invasive species or species of concern. So an invasive species is one that constitutes a primary threat to natural areas or native species or ecosystem health in Illinois. Um, prevention is one of the most effective and cost-efficient means of managing invasive plants. Regulations are just one tool that we use to help uh, prevention efforts while several laws and administrative rules exist um, that regulate plants uh, and invasive plants to Illinois. So the Illinois Exotic Weed Act is the primary means of regulating the movement of invasive plant species um, that threaten terrestrial natural ecosystems in Illinois. The Illinois Exotic Weed Act is administered by the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. And so that makes it illegal for anyone to buy or sell, distribute, or even plant any parts of these uh, listed species without a permit. However, because that original act is several decades old um, and only listed three regulated species at that time, it went through two major revisions, one in 2003, where seven additional species were added to the list, and another revision in 2015, an additional 16 species were added. So now we have a count of 26 species regulated by this exotic weed act. Um, and some of these species were introduced in the landscape years ago, only to realize they can outcompete native species and change the local landscape and, and the larger ecosystem. So even though species doesn't look to be taking over an individual yard, um, there may be wind or wildlife carrying the seeds elsewhere and proliferating um, the problem plant. Um, so we have some of these, again, regulated by Illinois Exotic Weed Act. Some are not regulated, but still present a very real problem for native ecosystems. These, this list here are just a few of the species of concern. Um, trees and tree and shrub species that are still sold at nurseries um, that are considered plants of concern um, are Norway maple, uh, Japanese barberry, burning bush. Uh, unfortunate about the burning bush, it is a really pretty plant. Um, the mimosa tree, winter creeper euonymus, uh, princess tree, and calorie or Bradford pear. Um, I will give you a few other reasons that calorie pear is probably a poor choice for landscapes as well. So if you already have some of these woody species on your property, you may consider managing them in some way, um, but at the very least, don't buy them anymore and advocate. Um, let anybody buy these species. So in with saying that, we often recommend um, native species. So a native plant is considered to be uh, a species that existed in the Midwest prior to the arrival of European settlers, as opposed to a naturalized plant which had been has been introduced into a habitat. Okay, so plants are considered native if it's occurred naturally in a particular region or ecosystem or habitat without human introduction. Uh, natives provide valuable resources for insects, birds, and mammals in the form of uh, nesting habitat, um, foods such as flowers, fruits, and seeds, um, and even leaves for leaf-eating insects. And these native species provide nectar and pollen for pollinators and other beneficial insects. There are many, many advantages to planting native trees and shrubs for gardeners as well. For instance, when properly planted, native plants have the advantage of being adapted to Midwest growing conditions. Um, they are vigorous and hardy, enabling them to survive cold winters and hot, dry summers. 
And once established, native shrubs and trees are more adapted to resist the negative effects of native insect and disease problems. Um, so using natives in your landscape uh, or in combination with other cultivated plants, it really enhances our natural surroundings. Um, these natives can offer seasonal interest as well uh, with flowers, fruit, nuts, and seed pods, sometimes even colorful or interesting bark. So these images are from um, are of the American hornbeam, also called musclewood or blue beech or ironwood. This is a deciduous tree in the beech family. I'm sorry, I think it's in the birch family. My mistake. And native to the eastern U.S. It's naturally found in areas with moist soil, including streams and riverbanks, but it does tolerate drier soil. It's typically found in heavy shade, uh, like in a forest understory, but again, is tolerant um, of some sun. It's a medium-sized tree that grows 20 to 30 feet tall and the same as wide. Um, because it is tolerant of periodic flooding, it makes a grand, great candidate for something like a rain garden. Um, it's a wildlife-friendly tree, which might be perfect for a pollinator garden. Um, or a children's garden or a native garden acting as a larval host plant or food source for mammals and birds. Um, again, I'm not promoting that we take this one species and plant it on every street corner because we still want to be diverse, but this is just um, an example of the many, many desirable species available outside of those very common plantings um, that only include a, a few species. And we will also include a resource um, that is the checklist of native tree species from Illinois Extension. So now that we've talked about all the conditions on the site and we think that we've located a good site, um, those site conditions should really dictate our species selection. Again, the right plant for the right place. Um, we discussed hardiness zones, so in short, if you live in zone four, select a tree species that is hardy to zone four. Uh, selecting a tree that's marked zone six will likely not do well or even survive in zone four. Um, please, please, please take into consideration the mature size of a tree. All too often we see trees that were planted much too close to another tree, lessening the light that both of those species will receive or planted too close to a driveway or sidewalk, which is then going, the tree roots are, might eventually heave that pavement. Um, we see trees planted too close to a structure like a house. Um, and if the growth habit of a tree is very columnar, uh, you know, just straight up and down, that might not be an issue. But if it's a spreading form and planted planted too closely to a home, the risk of having to prune that tree or a damaged limb falling on a roof is significantly increased. Um, you know, and when we choose uh, like a wide open space, at first it may really seem like this big open space dwarves um, a small newly planted tree but rest assured you know depending on what species you've chosen that tree will grow that's the whole point right it's going to grow into a much larger mature size um, and allowing that tree adequate space is going to reduce later stress um, whether it's you know pruning uh, or even removal in the future and ideally, we don't want to prune large branches um, because they're, they take a long time to seal over. Uh, and those open wounds um, stress the tree and they make it more susceptible to pests and pathogens as well. You might consider the drought and drainage tolerance of the species. As mentioned, some trees are tolerant of drought or poorly drained soils, uh, and some are less so. So in your site inventory, you've considered sun exposure and where you're going to plant the tree. Now you ensure that you you plant a tree that are that is tolerant to those light conditions. So as mentioned, native plants may naturally be more resistant to native insects and disease. Um, they're all uh, there's also many cultivars bred specifically for disease resistance um, available on the market. If a tree is to be planted somewhat near a walkway or driveway or road, salt tolerance may be an important factor uh, in the overall success of that tree. 
And we know here in Illinois, winter often warrants that spread of salt uh, to reduce the ice on those pavements. Some re trees require more maintenance than others. Some are good self pruners and drop limbs, uh, which some gardeners consider messy. Um, and some flowering trees that are chosen for their beautiful blooms may then produce fruit that creates a mess or even a hazard near walkways. And finally, we choose trees for their aesthetic value, aesthetic value like gorgeous flowers or interesting bark or color, colorful fruits. However, understanding some of these negative attributes can be as important as the positive, like the structural integrity uh, of a tree species, the performance, how it does over time. For instance, uh, a known problem with those Calorie or Bradford pear trees is that they're, um, they have such upright growth habits that it forms very narrow branch angles or branch attachments. And those are sometimes weak branch attachments as well. Uh, and for this reason, those ornamental pear trees are incredibly prone to failure in high wind conditions. So this is one I've seen recently, just this year, that I took a picture of. And it was in a whole line of pear trees. Um, and if you can see in the background, there were more trees that more of the pear trees that just split in high winds. So again, our um, our environmental factors like um, soil, climate, and light exposure. Another environmental factor that some people have to think of in their yard is deer pressure. Um, and, you know, <laughs> we'd be hard pressed to come up with a list of plants that are deer resistant. We could try our best, but they prove us wrong all the time. Um, uh, sometimes human pressure, you know, whether we're we're out playing in the yard, we're driving our mowers around it. Some of those shallow rooted species like maples, for instance, um, can really take on a lot of damage that way. Uh, we talked about diversity and natives and invasives. So, again, the environmental, cultural, economic and social factors of the site should be considered first. And then when we add these together, they're going to assist us in narrowing down the tree species suited for that site. Some tree, the way that you can buy, the ways that you can buy trees, um, bare root container grown or B&B, &B, which is a bald and burlap. Um, there are pros and cons to each of these tree products sold. Bare root plants are those that have been harvested and um, the growing medium has totally been removed. Those roots are going to need to be protected from drying out. Um, if the they have to be uh, sold before, as they're dormant, and if that dormancy breaks and the leaves or flowers begin to develop uh, on bare root plants before they're planted, Increased watering and wetting the foliage is going to be essential for that survival. So that's increased maintenance sometimes. Containerized trees are uh, just that. They are grown in containers. These are often we see plastic containers, sometimes in grow bags um, or other kinds of containers. They can be planted as a seed or bare root seedling or um, a plant previously grown in a smaller container. It's recommended to, of course, remove the container regardless of what material that container is. So even um, compostable ones um, is recommended. Um, it's common to find extensive root development um, when trees are grown in containers. And so for this reason, containerized trees commonly form roots that circle the bottom and size, sides of that container. So if we can notice that pattern going on when we're removing the tree from the container, we can cut those circling roots prior to planting mm -hmm. to prevent them from girdling uh, the stem or trunk of the tree. Finally, B&B &B or ball and burlap trees are those grown in the field um, and prepared for sale by digging them uh, so that some of the soil remains intact. These plants are generally larger and more durable than bare root or container plants, but they are also much larger, making them more expensive and harder to move. Um, they will also drink a lot more water than some of the other species, uh, other um, products. So when we, uh, we've we decided on our site, we've decided on our tree species and how we're going to buy that species. 
Now you go out to the nursery, um, what do you look for there? So when you're purchasing trees, no matter in what form they come, um, the crown heights should be at least 60% of the total tree height um, for broadleaf trees. And the crown height should be at least 75% of the total tree height for conifers. You want a tree that has a balanced crown, uh, kind of a natural shape, and so it doesn't appear to be one-sided or crooked or leaning. Ideally, you find at least a deciduous species, well, or evergreens, um, with one central leader. Um, if that one central leader isn't present, make sure that it can easily be pruned to only one leader. Ideally, also you can see the trunks taper um, and that taper or root flare is not covered by soil. There ideally should be no more than four inches of soil over the roots. Um, sometimes that does happen and in almost all of these products. You want to push through that soil, whether it's this B&B &B ball or in the container, push through the soil to find the depth to the first root. Um, the trunk of the tree should be kind of centered in that soil, shouldn't move independently of the root ball. This image shows the top of the ball after being dug, um, showing no excessive soil on the top of the root flare. So not the most illustrative uh, image, but there you can see the root flare. You can sort of see the first couple of roots coming out of there. And then, of course, the barks should be free of any scrapes or cracks. Um, you can even, uh, people like me are real, real pesky at garden centers and nurseries. You can remove the trunk wrap and check underneath of that. Um, just because one of the items is on there, you might have to ask permission, but certainly uh, check it out. If you're going to spend money on it, that's a smart thing to do. You also want to look for insect or mechanical injury. Like I mentioned, any scrapes. Uh, these wounds are going to be opportunities for pests and pathogens, um, potential decay. Uh, hopefully we don't see, you don't want to buy anything that has a lot of heading back or severe pruning because this may have been pruned. Those things may have been pruned off due to dieback or disease. So be very uh, aware of that. Um, ideally, our um, our branch spacing, branch attachment, we like to see branch spacing in that nice scaffolding structure. So when they're young, something like 8 to 12 inches between the branches uh, vertically. Um, you can see in this image, those branches are pretty close together. If I were pruning that tree, I would probably take out every other one. That way light can penetrate the canopy, um, making the branches left in those places a lot healthier. Um, then, you know, we the branch attachment, we wanna see wide angle kind of U-shaped branch attachment, not the V-shaped. Those are not um, as structurally sound. And then ideally, the trees that we select um, are grown locally to your location, okay, or have somewhere with a similar climate. They're going to adapt a lot better to their new site. Then uh, proper planting techniques, of course, are going to improve the chances of the tree survival. So once you get it in the ground, um, you know, and that we have multiple resources on how to plant trees. Um, just a word uh, of advice, staking and guying are not always necessary. Uh, they can certainly um, negatively impact the health of a newly planted tree. Like in this image here where um, the hose being used to secure um, to the tree here has rubbed a hole in that trunk. Um, that is a very irregular shaped wound as well. So it's not going to seal over very well. When, when we are creating that scaffolding, do it while the tree's young, preferably in the first three to four years, while it's still small enough to reach. Um, you want to refrain from piling mulch against the bark of a tree. Encourage others to do the same. We do not want to see mulch volcanoes. One of our colleagues often says, think bagel, not muffin. That's a pretty good visualization. You want to water adequately uh, as too much air to the roots will cause injury just as too much water would. Um, the general kind of standard is 
um, we want to be receiving one inch of rain per week per inch of caliper or the tree's diameter um, near the ground. One inch of rain per week per inch of caliper. Um, and less than that, you should be uh, providing supplementary water. Again, any early care provided to a newly planted tree is going to improve the chances of long-term success of the tree. And some improper practices like planting too deeply or stem girdling roots may take several years to appear uh, to we gardeners. These are again, some items. Uh, once we've got the tree in the ground and we think we're all done, um, we might forget some of these but they are very important. We want to remove all the materials from the nursery or garden center, um, you know, any tags or so on that are wrapped around the trunk or branches. We don't want to use the tree as a fence post unless you want it to become one. Um, also refrain from penetrating the tree with nails or screws. Um, we don't want to penetrate that cambial layer uh, that is just beneath the bark. Um, so our, the vascular system of that tree can stay intact. We want to stay away from the trunk of the tree with mowers and line trimmers. A, um, a recommendation there, a nice ring of mulch uh, can make this pretty easy. Um, and mulching um, has other added benefits like helps retain moisture. It adds organic matter back into the soil, reduces soil temperature fluctuations, and can help to suppress weeds growing around the tree, reducing the need for that line trimmer. And so these are a couple of the resources that I mentioned. Um, the Tree Owner's Manual, it's put out as a co collaborative effort between the USDA and the US Forest Service. Um, you can also look into the checklist of Illinois native trees. Um, and again, you are certainly welcome to reach out to local extension or even to myself to answer any further questions. Uh, you can view our past recordings of the Four Seasons Gardening Series on our YouTube, as Andrew mentioned. And finally, we will uh, answer any questions. You can scan this code with your mobile device.